and all votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public will be kept on mute until it is time for public comment. I will give instructions for public comment at that time, and you can also find instructions on the city's website. The public will be kept on mute until it is time for public comment. I will give instructions for public comment at that time, and you can also find instructions on the city's webpage for remote planning board meetings. I'll start by asking staff to take board member attendance and verify that all members are audible. Thank you, Catherine. This is Jeff Roberts from Community Development. Um, Louis Bocci, are you present? Is the meeting audible to you? Absent. H. Theodore Cohen, are you present? And is the meeting audible to you? Present and audible. Thank you, Ted. Stephen Cohen, are you present? And is the meeting audible to you? <laughs> present and audible. Thank you, Steve. Mary Flynn, are you present and is the meeting audible to you? I'm present and the meeting is audible. Thank you, Mary. Hugh Russell, are you present and the meeting audible to you? Present and audible. Thank you, Hugh. Tom Sinevich, are you present and is the meeting audible to you? I believe Tom may be joining us later. We will announce that in progress. And uh, no associate members present. So Catherine Preston Connolly, are you present and is the meeting audible to you? I'm present and the meeting is audible to me. So we have five point board members present. All right, thank you very much. Uh, the first item then is an update from the community development department. Uh, please also introduce the staff present at the meeting. Thank you, um, Chair. Uh, Iram Farooq, Assistant City Manager, Community Development. Um, staff who are present today are um, Jeff Roberts, our Director of Zoning and Development, and from the Zoning and Development team, Swathi Joseph is here, along with Daniel Nesplay. Um, and we have our urban designer, Eric Torkelson from our community development, um, community planning division also present. Um, with that, I am going to turn to uh, upcoming items on the board's agenda. Um, so today, today's meeting, we have two principal items, starting with the pre-application uh, presentation for the MXD district infill development, um, which resulted from rezoning that the board had worked on earlier in the year. Um, the second item is the continued hearing from last week, uh, from the last meeting, which is uh, for a zoning petition uh, for cannabis delivery. Uh, there are some procedural items as well um, that will be on tonight's that are on tonight. Um, our next meeting is May twenty fifth. Um, which is going to be focused on uh, the annual utility report from Eversource and the Department of Public Works, uh, which will include also the, uh, an update on, on the water system, which will be provided by DPW. Um, we will not be meeting the week of Memorial Day, and then the following meeting for the board is on June 8th which includes a, a continued hearing on 6624 Main Street uh, and then a, a zoning petition hearing on uh, changes to Article 22, which is a uh, the green building section of the ordinance. And this is a city council petition relating to, um, relating particularly to accounting for greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I'll say Probably the uh, recent item of interest at City Council is that uh, last night the City Council um, passed to and reading the um, the zoning proposals related to um, to retail land use table changes, well as home occupations uh, that the board had made a positive recommendation on. Um, also uh, for. Those who um, were watching, uh, the governor made some announcements about uh, reopening, and uh, those will likely impact the planning board meetings going forward. Um, so the state of emergency is slated now to end June 15th. Um, 
And uh, I don't have a lot more information to share beyond that because uh, we are at the city staff level uh, trying to make determinations about what level of flexibility we will have beyond that and for how long and what impact that will have on things like planning board meeting formats. Um, so as soon as we have information, we will bring that forward to the board at a subsequent meeting. Um, that is it from me, Chair. Uh, back to you. All right. Thank you. All right. In, sorry. Sorry, this is Jeff Roberts. Kind of to interrupt for, for one second. I believe Lou Bocci has joined us. Uh, Lou Bocci present and is the meeting audible to you? Uh oh, I was told that was the case. Maybe that was a mistake. Nope. Can no, I'm here. Okay, sorry, we didn't mean audible. Yeah, it wouldn't we come off mute. <laughs> we, we did not hear you. Okay, great. Uh, that was uh, almost really embarrassing. Um, thank you, Lou. So that's six planning board members present. It's also as a, just a public service announcement, if there's anybody here who um, got the notice and was coming for the uh, 1290 Massachusetts Avenue case, that's a, a special permit application that's in Harvard Square uh, by Santander Bank. Um, they've requested a continuance of their hearing. Get to that item on the agenda. The board will be voting on accepting the continuance, which would uh, postpone the hearing to a future date. So just in case anyone is, is here for that. Um, thank you. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Then we will uh, move on to the next item on the agenda, which is a pre-application conference on a proposal to amend the infill development concept plan for the MXD zoning district. This will be a joint discussion held with the Cambridge Redevelopment Authority Board. So they will begin by opening their meeting and taking attendance. Uh, thank you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good, I'm Lynn Bourne, the chair of the Cambridge Redevelopment Authority. For the record, this is indeed a joint meeting of the CRA and the planning board being held on May 18th. I'll now call the role of the CRA members and its executive director and ask if the meeting is audible. Please respond after I call your name. Vice Chair Red Crawford. Yes, I'm here and I'm audible. Treasurer Christopher Vator. Here and the meeting is audible. Assistant Treasurer Barry Zevin. Here and I can hear you. Assistant Secretary Margaret Drury. Margaret. I'm sure that Margaret is here. Those people. Don't. I am here. I am here, and I can hear you. Am I audible? Am I audible? <laughs> you are audible. You are not visible, but that's not required. Um, and Executive Director Toms. Good evening, Kathy. Um, I'm here, and it's audible to me. And I'd like to finally add that because this is a remote meeting, all vote taken by roll call, and our Executive Director will be re repeating the response of each member present. Thank you, Kat, uh, Chairman, Kat, Chairperson Catherine. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we'll start uh, by having CDD staff summarizing why this is before us. Thank you, Catherine. Jeff Roberts, Director of Zoning and Development, once again. Um, so just a quick summary. Um, this is development in the MXD zoning district, which is regulated by Article 14 of the zoning ordinance and by the Kendall Square Urban Renewal Plan, uh, which with the CRA will discuss. I think that has a different name now. Um, so when our, in Article 14 of the zoning was amended back in 2015, um, which authorized new development um, in line with the Kendall Square plan, um, that amendment to the zoning required the submission approval of an infill development concept plan by the planning board. Um, now, the infill development concept plan is like a PUD plan, uh, planning to develop, but it only governs the additional development that's authorized by that new zoning and, and not prior phases of development in that district. So the original development concept plan was approved in 2017. It was then amended in 2019. And the zoning was amended earlier this year to allow additional commercial development that would occur in combination with the siting of an electrical transformer substation um, within the district. So 
uh, this new development that's authorized will require another amendment to the infill development concept plan. And the purpose of this discussion is uh, this pre-application uh, conference is for the boards, uh, the planning board and the CRA board to review and comment on the basic elements of the developer's proposal. And this is to get input before the developer submits a formal special permit application. So a public hearing um, in parallel uh, with this process, the developer is also conducting community engagement processes that are uh, required uh, by the planning board rules prior to uh, application for their special permit. So that's, I think, brings brings us up to speed procedurally. Um, if there's anything that the CRA staff would like to add, um, you can you can add it or or not. Uh, thank you, Jeff. This is Tom Evans, Executive Director of the CRA. Um, yeah, the one change we made to the um, CASER uh, name change to the Kendall Square Urban Redevelopment Plan, that was a, an additional part of our amendment just to um, recognize our shift away from um, urban renewal uh, history of, um, of the country. So it was, it was semantics, but an important part of our um, amendment that also included this commercial square footage. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both so much. We will uh, now move on uh, to presentation uh, by the applicant. Uh, the presenter will be Ian Hatch with Boston Properties. Uh, you will, as usual, have up to 30 minutes for your presentation, but we hope you can be as concise as possible. And please also introduce any other presenters uh, when you begin. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Uh, good evening, chairs and members of the planning and, and CRA board. Uh, my name is Ian Hatch. I'm with Boston Properties. Really do appreciate you and the time to, to see us this evening and a special thank you to staff um, on the logistics. I know that was uh, challenging for a minute there. Um, I'm really, you know, I think there was a great uh, summary of sort of why we're here before you today. I'm, I'm joined by uh, my colleague, Michael Tilford with Boston Properties, as well as representatives of our design teams. Uh, that includes Alan Mountjoy of NBBJ, uh, Joel Smith of Sasaki, Eric Wyant of Stantec, uh, Tony Marchese and Brian Scrovig of Picard Chilton, um, as well as uh, members from the Eversource team, including Todd Lanham, Christopher Arnieri, and Chuck Eck. Um, and what we really like to do this evening is to facilitate a pre-application discussion um, about our MXD redevelopment um, proposal, which as you all well know, is the source of motive power for the relocation of the proposed electrical substation from the East Cambridge neighborhood here outlined in the map in orange um, to the proposed Boston property site in the MXD outlined in blue. Um, we understand that you have very uh, tight schedules, and so we've definitely um, tried to embrace brevity in our present materials. Um, but fundamentally, what we'd like to, to do is offer sufficient uh, context for you to understand the thinking that sort of is informing approach uh, to the concept plan as it stands today within the unique constraints and opportunities presented by this particular redevelopment proposal. And to do that, what we'd like to do is begin rounding the discussion first in some of the salient elements of the rezoning process that continue to inform our thinking as we've proceeded um, with sort of concept design work. Uh, we'll then pivot into a brief discussion of sort of our particular approach to the concept plan, given the uh, sort of unique constraints that we happen to have at this uh, location at this stage in the process. And then finally move in to a project component uh, specific discussion of how those ideas of how to approach the concept plan are actually being instantiated in our work. And we think that combined together, that'll give you a very good sense of sort of uh, what we are thinking for uh, the submission, which we are hoping to submit for your consideration in the coming months. Um, any questions before I begin? Great, uh, next slide, please. So I think this, uh, we'll start here because in a way, um, this is the catalyzing element of the whole project. And I think also um, continues to exert sort of a powerful force on its overall uh, organization. Uh, this is a conceptual uh, image of the Eversource substation and its associated transmission and distribution infrastructure. Uh, this is really the first of the three primary drivers of, of the project. Uh, to the left, you can see 
sort of an orange zone that denotes the transmission sweeping area where five 30 by 40 inch transmission duct banks uh, sweep in off of Broadway, pass beneath the anticipated residential site, um, avoiding uh, columns and other heat generating utilities, as well as other impediments to then terminate at the south end of the proposed electrical substation in the center of the Blue Garage Park, you know it today. Um, on the right, we have a blue uh, distribution uh, zone, which sort of reflects the area within which the distribution cables will depart the north end of the substation, uh, avoid a uh, utility easement for vicinity and biogen utilities, and then thread their way through uh, the proposed commercial west garage in much the same manner as uh, on the south side, and then reach uh, Benny Street distribution. And I start here because I think, as is inherently the case with a project predicated on meeting such a heavy infrastructural need, many of the principles of its, the organization of this redevelopment have sprung from the, the sort of requirements of the engineering, sort of requirements of the engineering requirements of citing this facility here. I think it's important to recognize that this should be thought of as a system and every one of its constituent parts must sort of meet the individual um, constraints that they have. In a way, I think that brought us quite early on in the zoning process to a vision of a centrally located substation allowing access to both Binney and Broadway purposes of transmission and distribution. And that vision has sort of remained consistent through our thinking to date. So that is a feature that you will continue to see um, in the concept plan moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. At the same time, I think one of the second key pillars of this project all along has been, I think, uh, an ongoing determined uh, engagement with the community. I think, you know, at least initially, one of the, the first sort of strong influences on the below substation concept were calls for uh, an attention to open space and pedestrian circulation. That was far from a foregone conclusion, I think, at the beginning of this process. And we have continued to pursue um, engagement with the community even after the um, the uh, rezoning was was sort of completed in in February, and I think that you will see in the individual reviews of project components how that has continued to influence our work in the in the concept plan. Next slide, please. And that sort of I think brings us to uh, where we really left off on the zoning side. This image is really uh, taken of, from effect of our last presentations on the subject. I think they're familiar to both boards. Um, and it really reflects sort of that last piece of the puzzle, which is the distribution of program, maintaining 100% of the delivery of the residential that had been envisioned um, in prior sort of plans, as well as the incremental addition of commercial GFA to cross up the heavy infrastructure associated with this proposal. Um, and that really, I think, sort of sums up the, the, the composition of, of where we left off and, and sort of the jumping off point for the thinking that we then began to do um, as we advance towards a submission. Next slide, please. And I think this is a sort of a key part here. I think some, some members of these boards may be familiar with um, our approach to the concept plan. Others may not have heard it yet, but effectively what, we are, what we're looking to do in our approach to the concept plan is a slight departure, I think, from past uh, Boston Properties precedent. And I think what we're calling it is a baseline massing approach. Effectively, what we're trying to do in our concept plan is for the purposes of advancing engineering and sort of refining to a higher degree of detail what the plan will entail, we're trying to increase the specificity uh, sufficient to facilitate the advancement of those key design and engineering efforts, but at the same to preserve the flexibility necessary to accommodate a fulsome design review process and building optimization process within the, the sort of purview of design review. And what this I think means is um, advancement of sort of larger forms that have an ability to respond to subsequent feedback, but that nonetheless enough um, baseline parameters that allows us to continue um, the, the engineering efforts that are continue to be ongoing, I think, in support of this project. And I think, you know, with that, what I'd like to do um, is actually uh, turn it over to the uh, design teams to sort of show you what instantiating that principle means. Uh, for the different components of the, the concept plan as we see it today. So uh, next slide, please. One more. 
All right, so th this will be uh, Tony Marchese and Brian Skrovig of, of Picard Chilton to sort of provide an update on the baseline mass of the commercial buildings, 250 and 290 Binney Street. Thanks so much, Ian. Uh, my name is Tony Marchese. I'm design principal with Picard. Um, and I, I, I think one quick note before I get into the, uh, the slide images, um, as Ian mentioned, you know, we're transitioning from the, 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 the zoning modification and the work that was done there. And in that capacity, uh, Picard Chilton, um, my firm, we were, uh, responsible for, uh, formulating the vision of my firm. We were, uh, responsible for, uh, formulating the vision of the entire, uh, set of parcels and, and, and I'll call it the early conceptual urban design. Uh, of of the the pieces and uh, subsequent to that we have moved on and are specifically focusing on the two north parcels as you'll see tonight the team has grown we've added uh, a whole group of talented designers and collaborators each with their their own individual piece but I, I want to assure you that as the individual pieces are being developed we have we as a team have been working together in a in a collaborative form to make sure that uh, some of those early concepts that you saw relative to the zoning modification are carried through. As it relates specifically to the north parcel, which you see here on this slide, the left-hand slide is kind of a bird's-eye axonometric view taken from the south. So you're seeing the two, uh, the two uh, commercial parcels, the west parcel on the left, the east parcel uh, on the right, Binney Street in the background, and just a glimpse of the the public green space uh, and a glimpse of uh, the Volpe plan in the foreground. Um, and then corresponding to that, the plan view on the right, again, with those same components. And the part that's hot in the orange is really the, the kind of largest uh, refinement or change that you'll see as a result of moving from the, the zoning work to uh, the early concept plan. And essentially what that entailed was removing the portion of the West building that interlocked and over, overlapped with the substation uh, in order to create a, a kind of a clearer uh, diagram and a, a sort of a more uh, workable condition with the subgrade uh, substation and the, and the building foundations. So in the next slide, please, you'll see the refinements to the massing that are being done uh, in preparation for the concept plan. And uh, again, to re reiterate what Ian said, this is by no means uh, the final design. It's really just a refinement from uh, the earlier slides where you saw uh, just a, a kind of a pure simple block of the massing. Here we're, we're dipping our toe into a little bit of building form enough to inform the engineering but also enough to create tasks that we can test with uh, sun studies and wind studies. And it, it, the idea is not to necessarily get ahead of ourselves and begin to design the building, but to just create enough form so that we can test those ideas. And so again, on the left is the axonometric, you see the two forms and the beginnings of, of some massing breakdown and then the plan next to it. And I think the other thing to note is you see the buildings now moved a little bit, uh, the south edge moved northward to create a slightly larger uh, public space and then to, to disengage uh, uh, from the substance. But uh, as you all know from the past uh, working experience with us, a lot more to come in the next phase when we actually get in design and look at multiple options for the massing, uh, the entrances, the layout of the building at the ground floor, facade, articulation, et cetera. And, uh, you know, we're very much look forward to that phase and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, happy to answer some questions at the end. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Eric. Thanks, Tony. Next slide, please. Thanks everybody for your time tonight. My name is Eric Wyant. I'm a design principal at Stantec. Uh, some of you in the, uh, that are familiar with the design um, business probably know our former name, Ad Inc., um, before we merged with Stantec about five or six years ago. And I, I bring this up just because we have actually a long history with this part of town, our office diagonally kind of across the street up at 210 Broadway for many years. 
And we actually designed, I think back in the 90s, um, what is currently the Blue Garage. So we, we very much think of ourselves as part of the story, both in the history uh, of this site, of ourselves as part of the story, both in the history uh, of this site and in terms of its future as well. So what you see on the left side of the screen is what we're calling our baseline massing. It's essentially a residential um, footprint that is based on a point tower typology. Uh, it's important to know that for a number of months, we studied a variety of typologies. Um, we looked at both a linear bar shaped um, building, which was much more similar to what was included in the master plan phase. We also looked at an L-shaped configuration. And not to get into the weeds, and I, I know we're trying to be brief, but this solution really came to, to the top for a number of criteria. One, with this kind of consolidated footprint that is located a little bit closer to Broadway, we're actually able to give back approximately three or 4,000 square feet to the open space at the Central Park behind our building. Uh, in terms of the shadow impact um, proposal, the point tower performed better than the bar scheme or the L-shaped um, tower. Because of its compact nature, it's really a much more efficient. We have less facade area, so it helps to minimize heat loss and heat gain. Uh, as Ian mentioned, the, the footprint kind of being pulled forward and off of the substation allows us to really create a more independent or kind of control our own destiny in terms of landing our structure and our core um, down onto the ground beneath our parcel. Uh, and the last from maybe a public realm perspective is the, the connection behind our building along the east-west pedestrian connection. By pulling the footprint closer to Broadway, we're able to make really a, a kind of clear wide open connection across the back of our site and across the back Akamai. So just going very quickly, the, the, the building is broken down into a podium expression, which kind of meets the ground. Um, obviously then stepping back towards our expression and then ultimately uh, resolving itself in some type of uh, expression of a top at the mechanical penthouse. Um, massing that you see on the left has been cross-referenced with the MXD and KSERP and K2 uh, and Volpe guidelines. Um, so we're starting to acknowledge um, many of the factors that have been kind of put into those zoning documents. And what you see on the right are just some very early um, sketches for how we might be able to develop within this kind of zoning envelope. It's starting to break down in terms of its scale and its proportion and think about uh, elements like vertically and really start to think of how we address each of the facades um, around our building from Broadway to the side that's up against Akama, the park facade, and, and lastly the east facade that looks back downtown. So just a few sketches of what could be um, amongst others that are in study. Next slide, please. And this is what the current ground floor kind of diagram looks like. So Broadway is running on the left side of the screen up and down, West Service Drive at the top of the screen and East Service Drive at the bottom. We think we have a really cool opportunity to make something special um, beneath our building. So what you see on the ground floor of, of the plan, colored uh, in yellow and red, is, is our building footprint, what is shaded in kind of a ghosted white footprint, um, just where it says, right above where it says colonnade, is the, the footprint of the tower above. But we think there's a really interesting opportunity to, to make a strong connection, both from our central um, park open space through our site and ultimately across the street into Danny Lewin Park. We also are really interested in trying to knit together the entry that is currently located at Akamai's front door across to us. Um, so we've set um, our active use program along that edge. So we have our residential lobby in yellow with its front door on the way, um, and then a series of open spaces um, that make their way towards the, the open space or the park space at the back side of the site. And then having our service elements located across um, e-service drive, which um, responds to the 10 CC loading dock and some of their mechanical spaces as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to the open space team. Great. Uh, this is Alan Mountjoy, uh, principal with MBBJ. Hope you can all see me. Uh, uh, if you don't mind advancing to the next slide. Um, 
Ian began this uh, talking about some of the technical constraints of the substation, which are uh, insignificant. Uh, so many of the constraints have to do with access uh, to the to the uh, the facility, which is underground. Uh, physical access for people who are maintaining it, access for ways in which uh, materials can be brought, which uh, materials can be brought down into that uh, facility. Then perhaps most importantly, the ability for intake and the ability for intake and exhaust to keep the facility cool. Uh, and you'll see a little bit how some has been resolved. Some of the opportunities that we see are taking what is approximately an eight-tenth of an acre uh, substation and thinking more completely about the areas on both the east and the west service drives, as well as some of the landscaped areas on either side of those that can be borrowed as visual space uh, for the for the size of the uh, of the open space, essentially for the central plaza. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, one of our biggest uh, interests is making sure that circulation is accommodated. Much of this has to do with uh, marrying this project together with the Volpe redevelopment and thinking very clearly about those east-west connections, but then also thinking about how those eventually translate as we head west to crossings across Spinney and across Galilea, Galilei. Uh, how do we make sure that, that pedestrians are easily uh, brought through this space in order to activate it, but also in order to enhance uh, the walking environment and connectivity to neighborhoods. So if you go to the next slide, we'll zoom in a little bit closer here. On the left is more of the uh, sort of with, uh, again, we, we turned the slide on uh, Broadway's below, Binney's on the north. Uh, you can see the Biogen buildings and uh, many of the uh, buildings that you've seen. If you zoom, if you uh, look over on the right, you can see many of the desire lines that we are accommodating, the east-west connections, the diagonal connections that allow people to get up to Binney, as well as some very local uh, connectivities between Biogen's two buildings on either side of the of the plaza. And then you begin to see sort of a zoning of the open space, which includes uh, the two exhaust, uh, the one exhaust on the north and the intake facility on the south, as well as areas where we intend to have greenery, uh, trees, areas that we intend to have for flexible recreation, uh, and then some areas that are perhaps more fixed, landscaped with features that are permanent uh, and uh, uh, places for people to sit and relax. If you go to the next slide, we can show you uh, some of the ideas for why we think it's important to provide a certain amount of open level space so that the, uh, so that the plaza can be programmed at times of the year uh, and episodically animated, depending on what seems appropriate, whether those are art pieces or, art pieces or uh, summertime games or simply places where you can put movable seating uh, to activate the space, depending on the time of year and the weather. Uh, if you go to the next slide, you can see where we've uh, done some initial thinking about how the intake in particular, because it will, it needs to be a freestanding object in the park. Uh, we're looking at a variety of ways in which that can be visually treated, essentially a 30 by 30 foot object. Um, and we're trying to identify ways in which thematically it could be interesting to look at, to interact with, um, and somehow uh, also evoke some of the history of the site. Uh, so this is still a work in progress. This is a placeholder for an object that will need to sit in the plaza to provide that required air intake. And it will have to be fairly tall in order to bring in the air at the upper levels. If you go to the next slide, it gives you a uh, a sort of an image of uh, an aerial image of what this might look uh, with. You can see the seating wall and planting along the edges. You can see the service drives on either side uh, that will essentially be treated as uh, pedestrian spaces with very slow traffic. Uh, then the flexible area in the middle 
the intake, and then some of the uh, raised seating areas, as well as the potential for a uh, a, a water feature, which has been we've indicated through the book engagement process, is a is a desired feature of the plaza. If you go to the next slide, you can see that uh, uh, again a more of an eye level view showing uh, the relative size of the intake structure, looking south in this case, and then some of the features, uh, seat walls and greenery that will make this uh, place comfortable for people to sit in uh, in in uh, in a year round way, as well as flexible areas for more seasonal. Uh, and active recreational uses. And I think that that's the last slide for us, right? Okay. All right, so uh, as was noted, uh, this is not a public hearing, but the boards can take comment at their discretion. Um, and as uh, uh, Chair Bourne and I have, have discussed, it is, uh, CRA is uh, uh, custom to take uh, public comment at all such meetings, so we are going to do so. Um, any members of the public who wish to speak should now click the button that says raise hand. And if you're calling in on, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. As of 5 p.m. yesterday, the board had not received any written communications on this case. Uh, written communications received after 5 p.m. yesterday will be entered into the record. Uh, Madam Chair, is it procedurally, can I add one uh, last point to this presentation before public comment, or I can wait to, it's entirely up to you. I just, I had a cue I was supposed to take, I didn't do it. Uh, sir, uh, uh, sure, <laughs> we have one last. Uh, it, it, it's just a truly brief non-slide amendment, just to say that in the course of, of working through these considerations across Eversource, uh, we'll be back in front of the board to discuss the 325 special permit, not in a modification sense for what's in it, but in how and when it's done, uh, involving things like the park and the head house and Alta and INI, all of which are underway. But uh, I just wanted to uh, say we'll be, we'll be back in front of those somewhat technical details um, when we have the opportunity. Okay. Thank you for that uh, additional clarification. All right. Um, I will now ask staff to unmute speakers one at a time. Uh, you should begin by saying your name and address and staff will confirm that we can hear you. After that, you will have up to three minutes to speak before I ask you to wrap up. Hey, this is Jeff Roberts and I'll do the public comment. We have um, one hand raised. So before I get to that speaker, I'll just note that um, I'll, I'll say again, if you're, if you're sort of waiting um, to speak, please make sure you push the buzz raise hand so that we know that you'd like to speak, or if you're connected by phone, press star nine on your phone. Um, so the speaker whose hand is raised is Heather Hoffman. Uh, you can unmute yourself and begin with your name and address. Thank you, Heather Hoffman, 213 Hurley Street. And some of what I have to say, probably most of you have heard before and, and you'll tune it out because the experience of living in East Cambridge and dealing with development in Kendall Square is of being tuned out. Um, we are here not because of what the people in the neighborhood did. We are here because the developers, Eversource, the city, the state, um, city boards, city planners, and probably other people that I don't even know that I'm not saying did not foresee this and do something about it. So, yeah, you're, you're moving this, you're moving the substation, but why was that even necessary? What I would like more than anything else is for someone who was in a position to make this be a better thing than it has turned out to be, to make it so that we don't have to deal with yet another too big building, yet another uh, squeeze on our housing. Just would someone just say, yeah, we should have seen this coming. We should have done something about it. 
maybe even we're sorry. That's what I'd love to see more and hear more than anything else. Because until we do that, until we realize that the way this city runs and the way this city does its development hurts the people who live here and enriches people who aren't living in our neighborhoods, enriches people outside of the city. Until we do that, we're just going to have more displacement. We're going to have more people leaving. And I'm going to have more people telling me I should be so thrilled that I could never afford my house except for being old enough. And for those people, I would love to hear how they expect me to live in a safe deposit box because I got to live somewhere. This whole setup is a disservice to all of the people who live here and to our, our children and everyone else who has been run out of this place because we don't care enough to plan because we're too busy counting the money that comes in. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I, I did not see any other hands raised during that time period, so I'll turn it back over to the chair. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, we will now move from public comment to board discussion. And um, uh, again, what we're going to do now uh, is um, first uh, questions. Um, and this is uh, something that we found has worked particularly well um, uh, at planning boardings where uh, board members can get all of their questions out on the table. Um, and the proponent can collect those questions and respond to them uh, all at once. Um, so uh, uh, Chair Bourne and I will alternate between recognizing people to make sure that we're getting a nice balance of planning board and uh, CRA board member questions, but we will get all the questions out first and then back over to the folks from Boston Properties to uh, respond to those questions. So with that, uh, is there a planning member who wants to start us out with questions? Ted? Uh, just two brief questions. So will the air intake and exhaust uh, create noise? Um, will you hear them all the time? And then my second question is, is there a structural or other reason why the uh, park area between the buildings is so much hardscape rather than being just grass and trees and uh, pathways for crossing it? Uh, are you are you looking for a response to that or no um, we are not so at this time uh, either um, planning board any planning board members or um, CRA board members who want to be recognized with questions uh, if you can use the raise hand function on zoom uh, to raise your hand then um, we will take those because I indicated alternating planning board member and um, and CRA board member but if we've only got planning board members, then we can uh, stick with those. Uh, Catherine, can you hear me? I can. Uh, good. I, our board has is probably more familiar with this project than the planning board. So why don't you go ahead and recognize okay. people, whatever <laughs> order. I'll just leave it to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we may be long on the questions and then uh, need to alternate more when we get to the discussion and comments. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Mary, let's hear your questions next. 
Um, I just have one, and that uh, refers to one of the uh, massing um, images, which showed uh, the two buildings uh, being connected by a series of, of elevated uh, <coughs> structures. And I'm curious as to um, how serious you are about that particular option and why uh, you think that has benefit. Okay. Lou? Mary, st Mary stole my first question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'd like to know how they uh, uh, figure on handling all the loading docks and entrances on both the access roads. And is that part of the reason for paving the um, mm -hmm. plaza over the substation? Um, will the change in the residential building allow for more ground floor retail? We had that discussion last time. Um, I guess the square footage you removed from the Northwest commercial building was moved into the uh, Eastern commercial building. Uh, like that, like to know what that was about. And um, yeah, I have concerns with the uh, seems excessive use of paving in the or the substation um, at this point needs to be more green, I believe. So those are my initial questions, I guess. Okay, thanks, Lou. Steve? Uh, I, I just have a very uh, simple and fundamental question, and, and that is, uh, uh, does this proposal reflect uh, the existing height and bulk regulations for this site, or uh, is something uh, going to be a, to, to, to go beyond what is uh, permitted as of right. Okay. All right. Any other, Hugh? I just wanted to comment that uh, Tom Sinevich and I have been participating <clears throat> in a joint design review subcommittee with the CRA. And so I like other members of the uh, CRA board and don't have quite because I've been, they've been answered at previous meetings. All right, thank you for that, Hugh. All right, um, I will turn to the applicant uh, to kind of go through those questions that the board members have just laid out uh, for just clarification um, before we have our session. Would you like us to answer them sequentially? Is that the most logical way to do it? However is easiest for you. Okay. Um, well, I guess sequential, you know, yep. <laughs> is a way and e interject. We have members of the team. So in some cases, there's various technical elements that I would like to feature uh, the experts on so that they can satisfy board members' curiosity a little bit better. Um, Aaron, take an exhaust. I'm going to point to Chris Arnieri and Todd Lanham, a resource, but Yes, an air-cooled system has fans that produce noise. Uh, the level of noise is a central feature in our acoustic mitigation package, uh, both through measurement and IDCP submission environmental impacts, but also in the station design. Um, and so to what, to what level is noise? The intent is not to be uh, noticeable, but Chris and Todd, if you could articulate further, that would be helpful. Yeah, you know what, Chris, I'll, I'll defer to you, but just, I guess, in summary, you, you said it well, Mike, that is, um, we, we will be, as, as the engineering progresses, we will be taking ambient noise um, measures, and we will be modeling what the fans and the exhaust would, uh, would add, if anything, to the ambient. But Chris, I know you've been working on this from the engineering perspective. Maybe I should just, uh, should have just... No, I mean, you, you said it right, Todd. I mean, the... The ultimate engineering, I mean, we're a little early here, but right, we'll have to take ambient measurements. Then we have to, you know, for the cooling required, we'll have a, a, an output for the ventilation on the exhaust and how much air we got to pull in. And then we need to, you know, determine what sound or DB level sounds that is. And then from there, we'll have to do attenuation to meet Cambridge City ordinances. So, um, you know, in summary, it's really, we will be taking those steps to make that you know, uh, acceptable to the, to the area. So that, I don't know if that answers it or if there's follow-up. 
Yeah. Well, Chris, I, I think we have to, I'm hearing one thing, but you know, there's a curiosity point in the past. What we should expect to do is substantiate that with further study to say, here's the decibel level relative to this, you know, uh, sound like a golf court or a 747, just for clarity, it will not sound like a 747. So I think that when we uh, come forth with these designs, it's important for the boards to know that this is something that's very central to our, our early thinking and that the acoustic condition of that park is uh, you know, obviously a, a user experience issue that we take seriously. So it's our job now to get people comfortable with it. I think, unless they'd like to correct us. Uh, Ted, did you want to ask uh, further clarify? Uh, I, I, I guess the last comment, you know, the, you know the, the, the various designs are attractive, and I could see people wanting to walk up to them and be next to them, and it's the question of whether it's going to generate so much noise that people aren't going to want to do that and going to want to shy away from them as much as possible. But the last comment was, they feel it's their obligation to make it user friendly. So I'll rely okay. upon that. We think there are some neat precedents for some of these uh, that we've seen, and this like, sculptural possibility and scaling element. And, and the MVJ team has been really creative with, with opportunities. We look forward to sharing those with you and their relative acoustic mitigation and aesthetic impacts. <laughs> Uh, the, the next question was the structure or other reason uh, there is so much paving or hardscape, and I turn to uh, Alan Mountjoy and Joel Smith um, on this one from MBJ and Sasaki. Um, there's no no structural reason. I think um, with the context of waterproofing for the station, um, there is concern about how we uh, how we engage the planting for large irrigation systems. It doesn't open us up to an obvious you know, water leakage liability. That having said, I've heard three comments on the relative greenery. Um, so maybe Joel and Alan, you guys could speak a little bit to some of the programmatic constraints you were looking at and some of your early thinking around this, and then um, just talk about that that topic. Alan, do you want to go ahead? I was going to let you handle this one. Sure. Um, no worries. I can handle it. Um, yeah, so like a lot of the elements that we have right now that we're currently showing is a lot more hardscape elements like for example like pickleball um shuffle uh, shuffleboard a whole bunch of those types of elements that you could basically lay down from a from a kind of a temporal uh basis and kind of lift those back up so having more of a kind of a hardscape um uh surface as it relates to that would be um more desirable than than something that would be green but you know obviously i think the biggest part of the the design was really in response to kind of the irrigation concerns as it relates to Eversource. Okay. Then uh, I think the the going sequentially, then the next question is on the connection of the buildings. Oh, wait, before we move on to that, Lou, did you have a, a, a follow up on the irrigation? Not so much the irrigation, but the green area. Um, okay. One concern is that there, it seems to be that, to me, that we have a very large residential building that abuts this uh, area. It would have some play area, green area, um, a portion of this developed in that way. Um, there are going to be a lot of residents, and they're going to need some place to hang around. I don't know if the paved area is exactly the, the uh, ticket for this. Understood. I'm, I'm hearing pretty clearly uh, a theme on that one. So when we come back, you can expect some further studies in that and very much agree with your sentiment about ensuring that this uh, park, in addition to serving the broader connection of parks, you know, also is respectful of the residents in the future building. Great. All right. Then on the building connection. Yes. Uh, uh, which was both from uh, Mary Flynn and Lubachi. So what I have is uh, how, how serious is it and why and do people want it? The answer is uh, people definitely want it. I, I, I shied away from this from the past, but um, the reality is, is yes, clients like the idea or poor people and their employees like the idea of interconnections. Um, I think I've looked at Tony Marchese to help answer a little bit. There are two practical things about it that make it you know somewhat worth pursuing. Um, but before I get into those, it's important to note that 
it's a possibility uh, from a phasing standpoint and just from the general size of these two buildings, it's very likely that, you know, it's two different tenants, in which case the connection is pretty irrelevant. But in the very rare event where one tenant was looking at this, you can see a desire. We, we get that a lot from, uh, from different users. Um, on a practical level, it could make what could be an interesting view, um, you know, a short moment in time from Binny and a little bit from Broadway with these, these potential cool interconnections where people are crossing back and forth, has to say it, but almost reminiscent of an ant farm to a degree. There's just activity. Um, and then the practical level of it is by putting uh, GFA massing into those volumes, it allows us to be modulate the height specifically on the east, which I think is something we'll get to. But, you know, Tony, could you talk a little bit about the design visioning for the connections and, and what it does from an urban uh, planning standpoint? And again, doing this while acknowledging that um, it, is, it is likely rare you have a user of that size, uh, frankly. But uh, I don't know. T Tony, can you explain further? Uh, yeah, this is Tony Marchese, Design Principal with Car Children. I, Mary, I think it's a... I think it's a good question and a, and a valid question, and um, you know maybe to phrase it a slightly differently than uh, Mike did. Um, as we were thinking about a massing that could be a little bit more refined than than the uh, in the in the kind of zoning stage, we wanted to include possibilities of what might happen in the future, and we thought in some ways to show and to model, to test some connection between the buildings gave us the ability to understand the impact of that, you know, as we did wind analysis, wind analysis, et cetera. But we also wanted to have it on the table as a discussion item. Um, I do think there is the possibility that a tenant could come along and want to take two buildings and have that connectivity. Um, but uh, frankly, I think ultimately, uh, the chance of there being a bridge is less so than uh, there not being a bridge, just uh, given the overall uh, amount of area that both buildings encompass. But I thought, it, I, you know, I, I think it's important for you to see it that way. And I, I would also say um, if, if we do explore bridges, our desire is to make them not just a way to get from point A to point B, but a, a, a design that allows folks maybe to occupy the bridge and, and use it as a collaborative space. And I think also we've had some discussions about, hey, if we are gonna create some connectivity, let's also make sure that maybe something interesting happens on the top of that connection. So this idea of maybe seeing some terraces or roof gardens on those pieces that might connect. Um, but you know, it's, it, it, it's so hard to predict, mm -hmm. uh, to be truthful. Mary, did you have a follow-up on that? Uh, yeah. So, um, I appreciate all of that. Um, it helps me, um, understand, um, the point of the various options and the fact that there are options and a lot of it is subject to, you know, future tenancy or whatever. My only, um, uh, well, one of my concerns is is you know as you look at things like uh, the wind analysis and whatever i um please also look at you know shadow impacts on that um as well i mean i know they're not huge um structures but they are going to have some some impact and i'd like to understand what that what that is um so that's it for now thank you okay no It's, it's a good note for us to make sure we, we include any incremental uh, shadow environmental impacts in so far as we, we, we continue to pursue it. So thank you for the note. Um, Before we move on, Hugh, did you have a question on that as well? Um, I have an additional question that is, uh, as a result of one of the answers. Okay. So maybe you should call on me at the end. Okay. Do you want me I'll, to I'll, I'll make sure to circle back to you then. <coughs> All right, Mr. Tilford, we can go back to you then. Okay, great. I just uh, wanted to go to the loading dock entrance, uh, which is and pavilion and paving of the plaza. The, the two points, I think, um, they are they are unrelated. Um, you know, we've heard you loud and clear on sort of just the, the green elements presented tonight and and uh, what's what's important. Um, so the paving, I think, could be taken out of that. It's not related to the loading dock. 
Um, the loading of the buildings are uh, the two commercial buildings likely to occur on the east side. We're trying to create the desire lines and, and happy to pull up the image, but in thinking about, you know, the best way to move people from Volpe through, and that would be on a um, east-west motion, is, uh, you know, across those two principal connectors. But insofar as people are moving uh, north to south, there is the Lowry walkway, the Kitty Knox uh, uh, walkway, which is recently redone, which is a big thoroughfare. So it made sense for us to use our west service drive and bias that more towards pedestrians, wound earth type conditions, um, uh, and, and less loading dock interference, and then probably put more of the loading situated on the east. Um, in every respect, I think at this density, we are going to have to have a full time loading dock manager, not, not too dissimilar from what we're doing at Proto now, uh, but somebody to direct traffic to, to minimize uh, conflicts and ensure that delivery is done in a timely fashion and that we're, we're using this as well. So I don't know, would you like us to pull up the proposed ground floor plan uh, uh, and discuss that further? Lou, you, you have your hand, so I presume you have follow up questions on. Do you want to see the plan? It would be nice to see the plan, but I also want to um, understand the existing loading docks, not the new buildings. I understand the new buildings we'll be looking at, but there are, I think, six on one, and I forget how many were on the northern access roads. Uh, it would be nice to know how those are going to be handled, if the uh, existing access roads will be adequate after this whole thing is done. Um, there's a lot of loading in those two access roads. What 100%, and you know, in addition, there's also the Biogen buses, which is an important part of the broader transit solution. But you know, Alan and Joel, um, it'd be great, uh, Ian, if you're controlling the cadence of the slides, could we go to the ground floor? And um, I think I think the answer is uh, to look at you know, responding and probably follow up uh, to Mr. Bocci's questions about how we're going to handle all the loading going through and maybe even bring in somebody from our property management team to talk about it. Um, but let's see if we can just pull it up to give people a sense of context here. Do you have a slide number? Uh, sorry, Ron, what was that question? No, I meant to ask, do you have a slide number? This is Swati. I'm trying to... Ah, okay. Yeah, you know what? I think it's uh, number 15. Go to 15. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Great. Okay, Joel, do you mind... Do you mind talking to that? Yeah, that's fine. I mean, so right now, currently what is conceived for the Wunerf Plaza idea, and particularly, you know, the way that we're kind of looking at that is that it wouldn't be a flush, totally flush condition. There would be a curb that would be envisioned there. And the idea is that that would be a four inch curb. Um, and the reason for that is number one, some of the existing drainage that's out there. Number two, particularly drainage as it relates to the service drives because the idea is that we want to maintain those spot elevations as much as possible. So with this with the Wunerf Plaza idea, um, you know, the idea is that we would have a four inch curb to handle some of the drainage and still maintain a lot of those uh service um, um spot grades as it relates to a lot of the, the service of loading for those for those two buildings. I, th I think it might be fair to say that the you can see on this drawing the two service uh, access points for Biogen uh, sit on the south side of the plaza. The north side has the pedestrian entrances to the buildings right. and has the majority of the landscaped elements on either side of the park. And that's where we have located uh most of this of the permanent uh more passive seating areas adjacent to a potential water feature the south side of the plaza is of course uh, some of it is made up of the intake area but also some screening of trees along the edges uh, that are still allow you to get into the plaza but screen some of the visual uh impacts of the loading docks uh, and the south part of the plaza would be more active recreation, which would be less um, uh, less uh, impacted by service drives. Lou? Yeah, I see the two that you're pointing out, but there are another four on that access road. Um, it, it would be nice to know how, I guess you feel there, the access road is adequate for loading for those existing buildings now and will remain adequate. Um, looks like we have some ad landscaping and so forth, and utilities are along that side also. There's an electric transformer and so forth, and some uh, 
gas some uh, gas uh, storage areas. I'm with curious. I'm curious how that's all going to work out in the public realm here. Got it. Why don't we we take that one and then just plan on uh, in subsequent presentations focusing more on it. Um, both both of the, uh, the service aisles are 20 feet in width, allowing for for double stacking and potential laybys. But to your point, how it works on the public realm is very important. So I think we'll prioritize that as a study. Right. All right. Uh, uh, we have more questions to go through here. Yes. I believe, I believe the next one was related to retail. Is that right? Perfect. Okay, great. Well, I'm happy to, to field that one. And uh, Lou, I think it was you who asked about sort of basically what's the marginal impact of that new residential sort of approach on the, the retail side of things. And I think, you know, the answer there is that it didn't, it did not necessarily create the uh, graphic that we just had up. So uh, Swathi, I don't know if it's convenient for you to bring that back up. I'm sorry to <laughs> to continue uh, asking for more slides, but I think what you'll notice about that plan um, is that we, we sort of shifted from a, a, a uh, bar tower typology in which the, the, the tower sort of extended from um, within the sort of residential parcel out into the center plaza and then landed structure um, basically onto the vault itself. Now, naturally for us, that sort of, as we continued the, our engineering work, uh, began to pose a, a point of concern and other feedback that we had heard uh, both uh, during the zoning process and after was sort of tested that there was a desire for a greater emphasis on that east-west uh, connection that you see there outlined between uh, the two Biogen buildings sent to the the Volpe side and then 145 um, and the other sort of Biogen building to the north and essentially the, the the point tower topology allows us to step back off of that plaza public space and essentially unencumber that east-west connection. Then also to, um, I suppose the word would be to emphasize the um, connection from Danny Lewin that's potential there. And I think the, the, the shorthand I would use is that sort of uh, colonnade zone that you see there outlined on the left. Create, fostering greater pedestrian connectivity, both in the east-west uh, dimension and the north-south dimension, was one of the, I think, the big sort of um, public realm benefits associated with this new uh, approach to the residential. Having said that, that footprint did certainly didn't create uh, space for more retail as a result. It's really a giving back of space to the exterior net-net, uh, in my view. Okay, Lou? The reason why I'm questioning the, the original set that we saw, this building was skewed and that was called out as a problem with retail on the ground floor. Now we have the colonnade area, which seems to make a perfect place for some small retail in a residential building. Um, if somebody wants to get a cup of coffee, you know what I mean? There's, a, there's going to be a lot of people living here and there's very little service right around this building. This mm -hmm. is a very large residential building. And it would be nice to see some of that ground floor used as a retail area for the residents. Well, while, while at the wide end of the funnel still, I can say that we do have retail incorporated. We plan to have retail incorporated into the ground floor of this uh, building. Currently, we are sort of imagining it being actually located on the, um, what would it be? The south uh, east corner, actually, um, right? Sort of the intersection of the East Service Drive and Broadway, that's sort of where it's conceptually living at the moment. But we're certainly, you know, I think that the point you bring up is, a, is an interesting one. And, you know, we're certainly open during um, programmatic changes at this stage in terms of just where that goes. At the end of the day, though, there is a requirement here to have 40 percent uh, frontage on Broadway um, for retail. So that's um, that is something we will hit. So there will be some retail um, in order to, uh, at the very least. So you can rest easy on that front. Well, the 40% is uh, a nice idea and um, putting in this colony, it seems to make a um, very good place for some small retail. It, it, we need more activation in this area. Um, it, these people are going to live there. Um, and I'd really like to see you concentrate on trying to move some of the retail down into that colonnade or around the corner. Um, it, it seems like it would make a much 10-4, hear the message. Thank you. 
Uh, Barry, did you have something on this point you wanted to follow up on? Yes, I just, I, I, I agree with Lou. I just wanted to point out that there's a, a rather nice unleased retail space facing the service drive in 145 in the Akamai building. So that would be right across from the colonnade. Great. Lou? I actually didn't mean to hit the button, but yes, and that would give us a little double-sided retail there, and that would make a nice connection. <laughs> okay. Uh, Conrad. Yeah, I'd like to sort of reinforce the comments about the of people living here and um, acknowledge that with uh, Binney Street Park and... Um, uh, me, you know, Danny Lewin, that there there might be some softscape around, but the the play structure or or some kind of play element, a playscape, or at least a, something a whimsical feature that'll draw attention of people that are interested in climbing, whether they're young or old, uh, I think would be a, a real benefit to this space, as I see it right there. Um, so one precedent that I just have a lot of experience with is the climbing structure. Um, north of the Volucci Fountain over at Cambridge side, which is isolated. There's no other play structure or playground around it, but it's tucked in between Graves Landing and HubSpot's offices and right around the corner from, you know, Leachmere Station and everything. And not too far from, you know, the very fine grain um, East Cambridge neighborhood. But it's, it's an attraction for people that are coming through the area or visiting the mall. Um, so I would sort of um, urge you all to sort of give this a little bit more thought to what might be appropriate and also take advantage of the opportunity to maybe thematically um, have some reference to the um, electrical work that's taking place or electrical activity that's taking place underneath and maybe have um, that be a reference for its design um, inspiration. All right, we have just a... Um... I think a couple more questions to get through before we go into that more general discussion and comments. Um, so uh, I believe we have a question on the uh, whether the project, ref uh, the massing ref reflects uh, the existing height and bulk uh, as out, or if there will be additional zoning changes uh, sought to or other relief sought to accommodate that. Thank you for, for bringing that question up. And yes, so far, all of the, the work that you see and all the work we've done has been intended to fit within the confines of the zoning envelope determined as of February of this year. So there's no sort of, at least in our modal assumptions now, there certainly isn't another uh, modification envisaged at this time. Okay, great. And then Hugh, circling back to you with a question that came up during uh, earlier answers. So it's, it occurred to me that the amount of heat that needs to be exhausted is really a great deal of heat. I mean, the size of the structures and, you know, it's a tiny fraction of the immense amount of power that's going through the, the basement. So I'm wondering if you're considering uh, microclimate issues. I noticed the exhaust is up against presumably a window, a, a building without operable windows uh, far away from the residential building. And then I thought, you know, how about having some kind of a damper so that you could actually use the exhaust heat to change the microclimate in the you know, it's close to where the, the people face is. Wouldn't it be great to walk out on a 30 degree day and find it's 50 degrees in the sun? So anyway, those are my comments or questions, I guess. So I guess uh, that's a question for the proponent. Uh, have uh, microclimates uh, that would be created by the intake and exhaust been considered? And if not, then it's a comment to. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's, we wanted to come forth and call out the fact that there is both of these important elements for the cooling of the station in very much as, 
as noted, you know, the intake thinking there was um, away from the residential and operable windows. And again, for clarity, we had this, this question at ECP team meeting. It's, it is air. It is just air that is passing across electrical mechanical equipment to cool it down. And, and Chris and Todd, feel free to elaborate more. But yeah, that was the idea. Like, well, the intake would make sense over by the residential, and its sculpture makes a lot of sense there as a scaling element, and then the exhaust by the um, by the uh, commercial. It's it's up higher both for resiliency reasons as well as for um, uh, uh, just I think some other other considerations. So I think it's ten feet above grade. So I'm not sure there would be a, a real difference in heat on um, on a smaller day. But you know, Chris and Todd, if you have any further thoughts on on you know this journey we've been on and, and trying to place this, please let me know. Yeah, yeah go ahead, go ahead Todd. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so ultimately, yeah, like Mike said, it's it's 10 feet above the air, above the ground level. So you're going to be a pretty good distance. This air will be warm. It's not like piping hot either. So. By the time the air would get to a person, I mean, they would definitely feel a temperature change, but it wouldn't be like a, you know, walking through a sauna type of thing either. So, um, you know, that is some of the other part, you know, also we're probably going to have to vent, louver this to vent more upward than downward just for sound mitigation reasons. Um, so I'm not sure we could do much with that. Um, Cause also if the, air is blowing on them, then the sound can make it to them too. So it's, it's something that, you know, as Mike said, I think we really need to take, um, you know, concern on the overall public enjoyment of the park. Um, so someone probably wouldn't mind getting a little nice breath of warmth air when they're walking out of the building on a cold day, but they probably wouldn't like it if it's very, so I think that's something that as we advance the design, we really have to, um, you know, take ownership of that and, and make sure we're doing it appropriately. Great, thank you for that. Kathy. Uh, first, first of all, I, I want to say that it appears as though we're, we've sort of um, slid into the comment portion of the meeting and my... It, well, we are back, we are just now transitioning to that. So yes, we 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 definitely had some questions that veered more towards comments. Um, we have finished the list of questions that board members brought up, and we're going to transition to officially to comments. Okay, I I I, I really wasn't planning to say much, but this notion of the um, intake and the outtake um, has made me tonight think of a few things we haven't, been, we haven't had such an explicit conversation about this um, at the CRA level yet but um, you know I, I grew up in New York and we were really accustomed to walking over um, subway grades in, in which you know like Marilyn Monroe's skirt blew up and and um, countless other women's did too when that that was warm air coming up from the subway and now I live in Porter Square where I'm, I'm not so sure how functional it is, but Bill Wainwright's wonderful sculpture, um, you know, at the Porter Square tea station was designed to, you know, turn in the breeze. And I know that if you had a sculpture um, over the outtake, um, the warm air make it turn. My, one of my favorite, um, dining room centerpieces is an Easter sculpture where you light the candles and then there are little fans that go that go around. It's a simple principle, but why don't, why can't we design some kinetic sculpture that works somehow with this exhaust that makes this a real place? Some Something to think about. And there may be something like that for intake areas too, something kinetic that would work. Okay. Um, we agree. <laughs> uh, so as Kathy noted, we are, are moving on to comments. So, uh, board members of either board, uh, who else, if you want to use that raise hand function, we'll, we'll just try to keep it, uh, keep it mixed between uh, planning board and CRA yeah. board members. Mary. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Um, so um, I, 
I had some thoughts on the open space as well. And I think it, they've kind of come up during the edition um, already. But my, my sense is that you really do need to look at this, um, this open space in the context of larger Kendall Square plan. And while, you know, grass and greenery is lovely, we have that in a lot of other sections of, of the Kendall area. And I have been concerned all along that there, there isn't enough um, hardscape, or there aren't enough hardscape areas where you can have um, play, play structures or areas. I know there is a few little pocket areas for like tennis or whatever, but, um, you know, the idea of having spaces where you could, you know, set up games, kids could, you know, do little pickup games or whatever, um, is appealing to me. Um, so I'm not saying there shouldn't be any green space at all, but I do think that, that we shouldn't be, um, necessarily shying away from, from the hardscape. Um, my other thought was, uh, in terms of the residential building, um, and you showed the, the various, you know, potential alternatives um, that have come up that you've been looking at so far. Um, I have to say, I was, my preference is for the, the first uh, version, which was kind of more of the block kind of pattern as opposed to the straight up and down towers. Um, I like that because I felt like it responded to the to the building next to it. Um, and I thought it was visually more interesting. So um, I know we're not at the point where we're doing design review, but I figured I'd just give you that feedback now. Um, that's it. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Mary. Conrad? Yeah, I, I agree with Mary's um, point about the context of built environment with the hardscape. I think there are ways to make the um, built environment attractive to people who are looking at whimsical experience, whether it's temporary or longer. Um, but I also want to sort of acknowledge that there, are, there might be a locked playground at Volpe. Um, there might be, um, continue to be that locked playground over at the Biogen building. And so for there to be some sort of publicly accessible um, climbing structure or play element is I think it's it's very important or else uh, that theme is is not the type of theme that mm -hmm. you would like to be consistent throughout the district of inaccessible place play areas mm. great thank you for that uh, Ted uh, well consider I have no problem with the the, the plan um, I think it, it appears to work very well. Um, I, I might not even have any problem, might in, even be interested in the bridges connecting the building. I think that uh, could be interesting, but I think, you know, significant issues have been raised about shadows and other matters um, uh, that would have to be considered. Uh, my main concern is, is really the plaza, which you know, it's cold and rainy and snowy for five, six months out of the year. And that just looks like it's going to be a cold and swept area that people are going to rush to cross. Uh, I understand, you know, the comments about having some uh, hard, hard space and play space. And I think some can exist. But, you know, we're spending so much time talking about green roofs and the lost tree canopy and uh, doing other things to comply with the urban forest plan, that this is an area where you've got a lot of square footage that could be green. And uh, there's no reason why kids couldn't play in the green space. I mean, I see it more like a Bryant Park or a post office square uh, <clears throat> that people will walk through and sit and enjoy. Certainly a play structure for kids is a great idea, certainly a kinetic sculpture of some sort uh, over one or more of the exhaust and intake uh, seems like a great idea. But I think, um, you know, uh, the, the, the form of the buildings are fine, but really you need to work on the plaza a lot more. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Ted. Other comments from board members? 
Uh, Barry. Sorry. Um, Ian, Ian and, and um, company have heard me rant about this, but I'm, I'm very worried about the proximity of the south corner of the apartment building to the Akamai building. I desperately want to see a, a set of views, perspectives that are not like your slide number 11, which, which is looking down from about 400 feet in the air. I really want to understand how that thing, how those two buildings operate next to each other as seen from the ground. One of the diagrams shows the, the pointed edge of the projecting bay on the Akamai building as being only 25 feet off of the apartment building facade. And, and I, it seems to me that really needs some attention. And the, the so-called variations on the apartment building name need to actually take seriously how you can mitigate that rather than just being based on on some arbitrary uh, notions of verticality or whatever. Uh, the, the original skewed scheme somewhat addressed that, and I guess I'm still not entirely clear about why it's impossible to land part of the apartment building structure in the footprint of the, the vault. You're showing a pair of column lines in there, so it's not a clear span structure. Um, so I'm, I'm still not entirely sure about what the real constraints are. Okay. Thank you. Um, Lou? Yeah. I like a lot of what's being done, like I said, along with the retail and all that. Um, I really would like to see the uh, proponent concentrate on the area around the residential building and soft area. Donate some of this um, square footage from the plaza to make a place where some uh, group of kids can have a pickup game of soccer or football on a Sunday afternoon, along with a play structure, a multi-age kind of an affair here. Um, there are going to be an enormous amount of people living right in this location. Um, it seems a shame to not plan for this ahead. Um, it, it, it needs to be more, um, to add a little more, um, I, I, all I can say is soften it. Um, I do like um, Kathy's idea of the kinetic sculptures. That's a, a little bit of whimsy that couldn't hurt. Um, and that's where really I think around the, uh, around this uh, site is, um, adding some whimsy, going a step ex step further to uh, make it a special place. Um, there were so many people living here. Great, thanks, Lou. Uh, Hugh? So, <clears throat> today I rode my bike down to look and see what the uh, my building, and see if it's visible behind the new uh, residential building. Uh, and I, I remind folks that the Akamai building was designed when there was quite a substantial park planned in front of the residential building. And so that really wonderful interlocking forms uh, we'll get hidden somewhat behind that building. Um, we'll say there's somewhat or a lot. And that's sort of a shame. And I understand Akamai thinks it's a shame. Um, something I read somewhere. Um, I think right now the, the main plane of the tower is roughly at the main plane of Akamai. There's a a lower podium that sticks out a bit, uh, which will obscure things. But as you get closer, then the angles get better for you. Um, the other thing that really surprised me, 
I had never bicycled down the access roads. And I expected those to be dark, smelly, and, and I was amazed, particularly the west one, you know, has this very attractive building with a front door, trees, it's set back. It's right where, of course, the new open space is. Um, and so I could really see how the open space location in that building uh, worked really well. The Biogen building on the other side is considerably less distinguished and um, there might be some efforts to make it more interesting in some ways with planting or sculpture or whatever. Uh, and uh, maybe, uh, sorry, that's a, something that is to be thought about. Um, so I guess that's, that's all I'm gonna comment at this time. All right, thanks, Hugh. Steve? This is so early in the uh, design process. I, I, I had only uh, two uh, quick comments. Uh, one with regard to the Akamai uh, building. Uh, if that design is so strong uh, and, uh, and unique, I, I, I think that um, when you design your buildings, you should really be thinking about how it looks and relates uh, to the, the, the Akamai uh, building, uh, because we will be seeing those buildings uh, in, a, in, in a single view, and, and I'd love to see you uh, design it uh, as a piece so, so that they somehow uh, relate uh, to each other, and, and, and it looks uh, like, like an interesting and, and designed uh, sculpture. Um, that's number one, um, and uh, number two is the plaza. Um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just a little uh, concerned that the, that the plaza is going to be bare. Um, um, I, I, I understand uh, your uh, your aspirations and visions uh, for the place, and uh, I, uh, and again, this is uh, early in the in the process. Um, but I had uh, only one thought that I just uh, at this point: trees. Um, yeah, there are places that, uh, you, that you can put trees uh, in a way uh, that will soften it, uh, add uh, some visual uh, texture uh, uh, to it uh, without necessarily uh, compromising uh, your vision of, of lots of space for, uh, for playing and for kids uh, and so forth. Trees will go a long way. That's it, two simple comments. Okay, Steve. Hugh, did you have something more you wanted to add? I do. Um, Steve, can uh, uh, maybe think of the uh, reworking of the underpass uh, in front of the science center. Um, and that's, be it, it's hardscape, it's entirely hardscape. Uh, in between the pedestrian sidewalks. Uh, and it's incredibly successful and very heavily used. And, you know, the only time it's empty is, you know, like the day before they put up the big tent that they put up at the beginning of the school year. Um, so it's possible with with programming to have something that's hardscape that's actually very popular and well used. Um, I would also comment that I worked on the Science Center. The reason it was so plain, it was all grass in front with like one pathway out of asphalt and a couple of benches, is we were way over budget on that building. Uh, the um, Not our fault, of course, it was the departments that kept there were 12 different Harvard departments and everyone wanted the best possible accommodation for themselves. And the budget, uh, you know, ballooned and ballooned on 
there was real uh, attempt to where, where the departments weren't weren't uh, trying to get what they wanted to, to cut it. Um, so, um, you know, 30 years after I worked on the building, to have or 40 years, to have this vibrant space in front is really quite thrilling to me. It is a good reminder that, uh, that you can, with, with uh, appropriate programming, uh, lots can be done. Um, any final thoughts from uh, either planning board members or CRA board members on this? I don't have anything original of my own to add. I think uh, my fellow board members have uh, brought up a lot of great ideas to consider and, and additional details that when there's an application, we'll want to know more about. Um, I am not seeing any further comments. All right, uh, Kathy, let me check in with you. Uh, if we have no further comments, I would entertain a motion by our board members to adjourn. Our, our, yeah. adjourn our participation in this um, agenda item. So moved. Good, and I'd like a roll call. Tom, can you call that for our adjournment? Sure. Um, on uh, adjourning slash departing uh, the joint meeting, uh, Chris Patour. Yes. Chris, yes. Kathy Bourne. Yes. Kathy, yes. Conrad Crawford. I believe he had to leave the meeting. Um, Brett Drury. She's still yes, yes. Mm. Margaret, yes. Barry Zevin, yes. Barry Zevin, yes. All right, thank you for um. Okay, thank you. Let, let us um uh, have you. this merge meeting. It's very helpful conversation. It, it was helpful. Thank you. And thank you. <laughs> All right, for planning board, then is do we have a motion to conclude the pre-application conference? Move. Second. A Lou moves, uh, Mary seconds, and we'll take a roll call vote as well. On that motion, Lou Bashi. Yes. Ted Cohen. Yes. Steve Cohen. Yes. Mary Flynn. Yes. Hugh Russell. Yes. Catherine Preston Connolly. Yes. It's all members voting in favor. All right. Thank you very much, and, and thank you to Boston Properties. Uh, and the project team, as well as to the CRA uh, for a productive uh, pre-application conference. Thank you for your consideration and thoughtful comments. We look forward to the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, our next item on the agenda is uh, a request to continue a case. So I'm going to do that and before I give us a break. Um, next item is the public hearing on PB. 387 application by Santander Bank NA to relocate an existing of the Santander Bank to a new location along the street on the first floor of an existing building pursuant to section 20.54.9 frontage restrictions. Uh, CDD staff will begin by summarizing what's in front of us. Thank you, Kevin. This is Jeffords. Um, so this would be a new special permit application and the first special permit application to the planning board for a bank to exceed 25 feet of frontage facing a street or 30% of the building's total street frontage in the Harvard Square uh, overlay district. So this was reviewed by the Harvard Square Advisory Committee on April 29th um, and there's a report to the board, CDD um, provided the criteria and comments and a memo and then subsequent to that, the board received a letter from the applicant on this case requesting a continuance to July 13th or later in order for the applicant to revise the application. Um, so if the board approves this request, and, and our suggestion would be for the board to, um, to grant a continuation to, uh, as it says, to July 13th or later, um, then you know, we will send uh, new notices after we get 
additional materials from the applicant. We will schedule it. It, it could be July 13th. It could you know, be later, depending on how long it takes to get the materials together. But we will we'll schedule that. We'll have it posted on the web page and send out notices for the hearing, as we always do. Okay. And I believe a, a representative of the applicant is here in case the board members have any questions before considering that uh, request. Okay. Are, are there any questions or comments from board members on the request for a continuance? If not, then is there a motion to continue this case to July 13th or a later date with notice to be provided of the future hearing date? Steve, so move. Steve moves. Second. Uh, roll call vote. So on that motion to uh, approve the continuance, Lou Bocci? Yes. Ted Cohen? Yes. Steve Cohen? Yes. Mary Flynn? Yes. Hugh Russell? Yes. And Catherine Cronnelly? Yes. That's all members voting in favor. All right. Um, I'm going to give board members a, a quick five minute break um, and then we'll come back at 820 uh, to take up um, the cannabis career establishment zoning uh, that we deferred from last week. Uh, so we are in recess to 820.
Okay, uh, we will reconvene this meeting of the planning board now um, and move on to our next item on the agenda, which is a public hearing on a zoning petition by the city council to amend articles two, four, and 11 of the zoning ordinance of the Cambridge to create new land use classifications and associated regulations for cannabis career establishment and cannabis delivery operators. And we will start with having CDD staff summarizing why this is before us. Thank you, Chair Connolly. Uh, Daniel Mesplay here, Senior Zoning Manager for CDD. I'm going to spend just a few minutes going through the nuts and bolts of the zoning petition. Um, but first, I just wanted to give a quick update to the board on the ordinance committee hearing that was held uh, last Wednesday on the 12th. Um, so the ordinance committee ultimately moved the zoning forward to the full council with a favorable recommendation. Most of the zoning discussion centered on whether the required buffers for cannabis delivery operator uses, which we'll talk about during this presentation, could be reduced or removed altogether uh, and whether that would fundamentally alter the character of the petition. Uh, there was also conversation um, about whether the staff could add provision would deter the cannabis career establishments from locating in vacant storefronts in retail and mixed use districts, uh, which we will also talk about. Uh, so without further ado, let's, let's run through these slides. So Swati, can you change the slide again? Thank you. Uh, so Cambridge has spent the last few years building out internal zoning and permitting infrastructure for adult recreational adult recreational cannabis uses. At that time, it was anticipated that home delivery of cannabis products would be a future consideration, but it was not permitted by the Cannabis Control Commission. Fast forward to late last year, and the CCC adopted amendments to its regulations, which enabled home delivery of adult use cannabis products. So the city council initiated a zoning petition, which was reviewed by this board in October of last year. And at that time, the planning board made a positive recommendation on petition, but suggested that it would be less restrictive. And the city council agreed with that sentiment and asked city staff to develop a petition that would be consistent with state regulation changes and also expand where these uses would be allowed within the city. Next slide, please. And one more, thank you. So from a 30,000 foot level, this zoning petition follows the same terms that are used at the Cannabis Control Commission in reference to home delivery uses. So there are two new land use classifications here, a cannabis delivery operator establishment and a cannabis courier establishment. The cannabis delivery operator establishment is almost like a warehouse or distribution center. So it can purchase wholesale products. It can store them and repackage and relabel them on site and deliver directly to consumers, but it cannot operate a storefront on site. The cannabis courier establishment is almost like a dispatch office for home delivery. So the physical point of sale is still at an existing approved adult use retailer. And the cannabis courier simply facilitates the delivery from that point of sale to consumers. So it cannot sell directly. And it must also have state regulated delivery vehicles, which need to be parked site outside of business hours. Next slide, please. In terms of where these uses would be permitted, we've proposed that the cannabis career establishments be permitted by right in all office, business, and industrial districts. For the delivery operator establishments, these would be permitted only by planning board special permit in all office, business, and industrial districts. So this would be the same as cannabis retail stores, but would also be allowed in office districts. And the reason why we are proposing it this way um, is, is so that it gives the city council kind of the broadest range of consideration and they can scale it back as they see fit. So rather than starting with a smaller set of districts and needing to file the petition over again, if uh, the council wished to expand uh, where those uh, districts uh, would allow these uses. Next slide, please. 
We currently have buffer requirements for adult use stores. So in this zoning petition, we do not recommend include requirements for cannabis courier establishments because there's no product actually being stored on site. For cannabis delivery operator establishments, because there is product storage, repackaging and relabeling on site, we've proposed similar buffer requirements as we require for existing adult use retailers. So that's 300 feet from schools, parks, and recreational areas. Next slide. At the core of these delivery uses are questions around uh, parking, traffic, and transportation logistics. So we've included some baseline requirements that these uses would submit a logistics plan that is subject to review and approval by traffic, parking, and transportation and the police department, which is already required for existing adult recreational uses. Part of the strategy for including a logistics plan is to have a clear regulatory process that doesn't require as much direct involvement from the planning board. So this uh, codifies in the zoning some of the standard types of conditions that are typically included in planning board special permits. Uh, lastly, uh, you'll see noted here low minimum parking requirements and what we mean by that is that minimum parking would be waived for any establishments up to 4,800 gross square feet or up to 8,000 square feet in higher density districts close to transit, which tracks with the lowest minimum parking requirements we have in the zoning ordinance. Next slide. We've touched on this briefly already, but just to note how these proposed uses would be viewed. The cannabis courier is as of right but would still need to comply with the requirements of section 11.800 in, uh, in the Kane ordinance. For the delivery operator establishments, a planning board special permit would be required and criteria for approval are the same as for retail uses and the general special permit criteria in section 10.43. I should also point out here that the size of these is limited. Um, the size of the cannabis delivery operator uses is limited to 10,000 square feet, which is something that uh, is included in the Cannabis Control Commission regulations. Next slide, please. There are some changes also proposed to the business permitting ordinance as part of these amendments. So this is more of an FYI um, because the planning board's review of the petition is limited to the zoning and, and not the business ordinance. But again, it adds some of the definitions that are now included at the state level um, and adds the requirement for the submission of a uh, transportation logistics plan and also makes it um, contingent upon renewal of a business permit that there are no outstanding zoning violations or violations of traffic parking and transportation regulations. Next slide. So to, to kind of segue into our discussion on this, um, some things to think about in terms of these proposed changes. The ordinance is designed to be uh, fairly permissive. And for both of these establishments, uh, the, the product cannot be sold directly on site. So the uses themselves will function more like warehouses and dispatch offices. And something to consider and something that the ordinance committee um, so raised as a concern was that it, it could potentially create voids of street level activity in some of the retail and mixed use areas where they're proposed to be permitted. Another thing to think about is whether the cannabis delivery operator, so the kind of warehouse type of use, would compete with existing retailers uh, since they are able to deliver directly to consumers. And then lastly, uh, something that has kind of popped up as uh, delivery of many different types of goods and services has become popular, especially during 2020, is um, you know, whether or not these cannabis courier establishments will essentially uh, function as a middleman between the adult retailers and the home consumers. We hear a lot about these third party services and how they add costs and cut into revenues of the businesses themselves. And we do kind of raise the question um, and necessarily have an answer about whether something similar would occur with cannabis courier establishments in existing approved retailers um, or not. Next slide, please. Oh, next slide, Swati. Thanks. 
Uh, so here's a quick recap of what we've talked about. So what the new uses are, where they're permitted, if buffers are required, the parking and transportation standards, the review and approval process, and other non-zoning requirements, uh, and some thoughts and considerations to kind of kick off the discussion. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll stop here. I think that's our last slide. Um, and I'll turn it over to Jeff if there's anything that I, I missed. Otherwise, um, back to uh, you, Chair Connolly. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. This is Jeff. And the only, I guess the only thing that's left is the reminder that the planning board's act on this is to make a recommendation to the city council. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Jeff. Um, all right. So this is a public hearing um, and any members of the public who wish to speak on this matter should now click the button to raise hand. And if you're calling in by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. As of 5 p.m. yesterday, the board had received no written communications on this case, but any written communications received after 5 p.m. yesterday will be entered into the record. All right, Jeff, I'm not seeing any uh, speakers. So you can- I Oh, I'm sorry. This is Jeff. So I am also not seeing any hands. I'll just give one reminder in case uh, people are are kind of drifting over to their um, devices and are um, trying to find the buttons. Um, if you're on Zoom on your computer, there should be a button that says raise hand. If you would like to speak, please push that button. If you are connected by phone, please press star nine on your phone. So we'll just give it a few more seconds. Um, I think I would say that it doesn't appear that there's anyone who is um, here to speak. So I will just turn it back to the chair for, for discussion. All right, thank you, Jeff. Uh, we will now move from public comment to board discussion. And if the hearing were to be continued to a future date and additional information is received, uh, there will be an opportunity at that time for public comment. Um, all right, so we'll move on to questions from uh, the board for CD staff. And I'm seeing so many hands. Lou, you had yours up right away. So let's start with you. I guess this is more of a clarification. Um, I noticed when Daniel um, spoke about this that he said that they were authorized to repackage. Um, as far as I can see in the, in the document, they are not authorized to repackage. Um, also, there are a couple of other issues that I would like some clarification if anybody knows. I, I looked up, looked through legislation, the CCC's rules. Um, so there is no delivery to public housing and there is no delivery to um, college campuses. Uh, I'd like to know if that's true. Um, and also, this cannot be counted as retail. And I don't know if that's true. Daniel, do you or, or Jeff want to take uh, answer those questions? Sure. Thank you, Chair Connolly. Uh, Daniel must play again. Uh, to, to Lou's question about uh, whether repackaging is permitted for delivery operator establishments, thank you, Lou, for correcting me. You're, you're correct. I do not believe repackaging on-site is permitted for delivery operators. About um, whether delivery uh, is prohibited to public housing and college campuses, um, Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that's true, that you, you would not be allowed to deliver to those sites. Um, and I, Lou, if you don't mind, um, and through you, uh, Donnelly, your question about whether they can be counted as retail, could you expand on that for me a little bit? I just, I, I want to make sure I answer the question correctly. Yes, when I looked into the rules the CCC has put out, um, I guess in response to uh, brick and mortar uh, pressure from um, actual stores, um, they have put this, um, uh, a caveat in here that this cannot be considered as retail. 
thank you, Lou, for the clarification. Um, I, I, I'm not 100% certain what whatever when they say can't count as retail. I will clarify that for both of these types of uses, um, there, there can't be a storefront associated with them. So if you're a standalone for, for either of these uses, you can't have customers coming to the site for, for a sale. I think they were more concerned with the um, the delivery operator establishment um, being a re being, and their concern was how do you tax this? How do you zone this? How do you uh, work a community agreement and so forth? If this is not considered retail, I don't know. That's a little bit of a dark spot. I'm curious. So th this is Jeff. Just to um, just to fill in, I think I think Daniel got most of those right. I, I honestly I don't know if um i don't know about the rules about delivery to public housing and in, in college campuses but that's that's not something that we would be regulating through zoning that would that would all be through the through the state licensing and as for being counted as retail i i would just again as daniel said i'm not not sure what in what context but in in the context of the zoning proposal um it would not be a cannabis delivery operators and couriers would would both not um be counted uh that wouldn't be within the retail section of our land use table and and part of that kind of bridges over to some work that we've we've been doing sort of elsewhere where we've we've tried to create a, a clearer definition of retail in our zoning ordinance and that definition requires there to be sales or services conducted on site and the the key with the cannabis delivery operators as daniel said is that there is no Ooh. customers can't go to the site to shop there. It, it's only a distribution center. So according to our zoning, it's uh, not a retail use. Okay, so that would fit into our zoning in an office use then somehow? So the courier uses, I'm sorry, Daniel can correct this, but courier uses would be transportation section of the zoning ordinance and then the delivery operate, or operators would be, uh, I believe in an industrial uses. Uh, right, ne right next to um, kind of parcel delivery distribution sites, which is, uh, there's some use that's similar to it. Yes, I was more curious where it fit in if it wasn't being called retail. Uh, would, would somebody be able to use this in a retail location? I don't know why they would want to site their place in a retail area. but um, I did have some concerns with the delivery, no delivering. And I think the house, the public housing is because most of them are federally owned. Um, but college campus and so forth, you know, information is a good thing. It's just um, some more to chew on to decide whether this is um, really the right legislation. Yep, I got you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Ted, do you want to go with questions? Uh, yeah. Um, most of them are language questions. Well, first of all, um, my understanding from last time we talked about this, that uh, these delivery operators or couriers uh, are not limited to, you know, the, the bounds of the city. So the city could deliver to Somerville or Boston or anywhere. And simultaneously, even if we had no uh, authorization for these facilities in Cambridge, a facility I could call a place in Somerville or Medford or wherever, and they could deliver to my my home in Cambridge. That, that, that is correct, isn't it? Thank you for the question, uh, Daniel. Must here again. Uh, yes, that that's correct. This um, th this is regulating kind of the the permanent land use of these businesses within the city of Cambridge, but it does not. There's no geofencing or a pro blanket prohibition on kind of where you can source the delivery from. Okay. All right. So a couple of uh, language questions. Uh, in the definition of cannabis establishment, uh, shouldn't uh, cannabis courier establishment also be included there? I mean, there is a reference to delivery licensee which I assume pick up the delivery operator establishment, but it, it seems silent on the courier establishment. Thank you, thank you for the question. Uh, Jeff, it, excuse me if I'm wrong or jump in if I'm wrong, but I, I would imagine that we would 
we would want the cannabis courier establishment to be included in that definition. Um, so that, that might have just been something that we missed. Okay. Um, in the parking requirements. I'm sorry to interrupt. This is, this is, I was just looking, I was just looking at the page in the, in the zoning. I'm trying to, I was just trying to understand the question. So your question was, shouldn't. On, on page one, your definitions, your amending definitions. So you're adding definitions of cannabis courier establishment and cannabis delivery opera establishment. And then in the existing definition of cannabis establishment, you've added marijuana micro business and delivery licensee. I assume delivery licensee covers the cannabis delivery operator establishment, but it seems silent on cannabis courier establishments. Right, I see. I, I'm sorry. I was looking at the definition under cannabis use. Well, the only thing I would say is that we've, so we we've been developing this, um, and these these comments are all really helpful. That that we've been developing this in coordination with the law department, and what we've been trying to do is keep it tracked to the language in the um, state regulations to the extent possible. So we'll we'll look back at that again to see if. Um, to see if it covers all of the of what the state considers to be a cannabis establishment and and whether it, it leaves anything out i believe it is intended to include the all of the delivery establishments okay all right so next question is where you're amending the schedule of parking and loading requirements uh under the new row l uh, i think it's because of the way our tables are set up it, you know, under residency C1, C1A, office, blah, 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 or business C, you know, under two of the categories, two of the columns, it says one per 1,200 1, square feet or one per 1,600 square feet with a footnote relating to section 1.80, 800. Shouldn't there also be a footnote indicate making it clear that you not have a cannabis courier establishment or a delivery operator establishment in any residential district? I, I mean, it, it's it's just because the column encompasses so many different things that it may give some people the idea, even though it's stated no elsewhere, that they could have a one of those facilities in a residential district. Yeah, yeah. So this is Jeff, and well, I'll just be candid that it—that's typical throughout the use. Or th I'm sorry, throughout the schedule of parking requirements and ordinance that there. That's just the way it's. That's just the way it's arranged, and yes, it can be kind of confusing when it's a use that's not allowed in the zoning district. But it's the parking requirements are totally separate from the the use requirements. Um, I mean, I suppose we could try to clarify that. If we did that, we probably would want to go back and clear the whole, the whole parking table, um, which is maybe beyond the scope of this exercise. Okay, and then uh, keeping that in mind, I'm wondering whether footnote 16 here conflicts with section 11.04a. So footnote 16 says parking for delivery vehicles uh, shall be provide shall be provided in accordance with section 11.800 and may not be reduced or waived by the provisions of this article six. But then section 11.804a um, sa says provisions set forth in article six that allow for a reduction or waiver of retail or street parking shall apply except as set forth below. So it seems to me they're in direct conflict with each other. So you might ask the law department about that one too. Certainly, we can try to we can try to clarify the language, but just to be just to be clear on the intent, the intent is that there is a just like with any land use, there is a, a sort of baseline minimum parking requirement, and that's basically parking that's intended for. Um, employees, 
um, in this case, not really customers because there aren't there aren't customers on site. Um, it would be typical of, and the, the parking is typical of a um, of an industrial use. And as Daniel said, the use itself has to get big before you're even required to have any parking at all. The issue is that we we wanted separate from the normal parking requirements. We wanted to ensure that for these, because the state requires that they have dedicated a fleet of delivery vehicles parked on site that to make sure that off street parking would be provided for each of those delivery vehicles. So there's sort of two separate requirements and we'll, we'll try to do a better job of clarifying how each of those different sets of requirements apply. Okay. And then my third, my last question, which I guess I'm side with now is why did the provisions of 11804 D and E, which require all this information to traffic and parking, was it added here? It seems like we were over-regulating again, but as Daniel said, if that was intended to provide the information that our special permits normally ask for in any event, it seems like, well, fine. So then it's, it's, I, I, I can accept that. Those were my questions. Hey. Thanks, Ted. Um, Steve, go to you next. Uh, yeah, yeah, I just have a, a few comments. Um, you know, we, we, we treat uh, marijuana so differently uh, than anything else. And, uh, you know, it may be one thing uh, to, to discuss uh, the pros and cons of having a retail establishment uh, in the neighborhood. Gosh, we, we're just talking about uh, yeah, deliveries here. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think it should be thought of and treated much uh, differently than uh, deliveries of, uh, you know, bananas or, or uh, you know, if you order, uh, you know, something from a restaurant or from a drugstore or, or anything else. So we have, you know, this you know, totally uh, unique uh, section uh, about for deliveries of this particular product. Um, but I honestly don't see uh, that, that it should be treated any differently than delivery any other uh, product uh, in, the, in the community. It's now legal uh, in the state. It's legal uh, in our uh, city. Um, we do uh, appropriately have some interest perhaps uh, about the retail establishment. And, um, but for delivery, uh, I would make it a, as uh, a, a, as open and unrestrictive and as uh, unregulated a, as possible. I, I, I think you just too often, um, you know, us, uh, you know, we really uh, educated, caring uh, people. We're always uh, looking for how to, you know, really, really regulate uh, things in, in all sorts of detailed ways. And uh, I, I think sometimes we we think too hard, uh, and we want to regulate and define uh, too much. Subject, of course to state regulation. I don't know exactly what those regulations are and we've got to leave, live with that. Yeah, but subject um, to state regulation, uh, as far as the city goes, I would make uh, this as unrestricted and as unregulated as possible. Uh, it shouldn't be treated uh, differently uh, than uh, the delivery of uh, any uh, other food or, or any other product, really. Okay, thanks, Steve. Hugh? So my question is whether the state regulations require that the delivery service delivers building or hmm. uh, could it be delivered to a street corner or a public park or a, you know, a party going on in a public park, um, I mean, you know, with cell phones and things, you could imagine that happening. And then the second question is, do we actually care? Sort of follows along Steve's comment, but I'm curious to know whether it has to go to a building. I believe Amazon, basically you can't order something on Amazon to get delivered unless you give them 
physical address. Thank, thank you for the question. I, I'm, I'm kind of digging back into my memory of, of the state regulations as well. And, and I believe that uh, it, it's the same um, as, as within Amazon. You would, you would need uh, actual physical address um, that's, that's tied to uh, something that has brick and mortar associated with it in order to receive that. And I think the, the reason for that is that there's some pretty, um, pretty detailed tracking and documentation of the order flow as it goes sale to delivery and then, and then back that occurs. Um, and, and that's, that's perhaps the, the rationale for it. Um, but that, that is my memory in general. Correct me if I'm wrong. I, I mean, I, I think it, um, and I, I, I may be overextending my own knowledge, but my, my recollection of this is that it, it's even further than that, that it really has to be to a, a home address. Um, you know, people can't, I mean, it, as Daniel was saying just now, the, the whole system of um, cannabis product sales within the state is, is so highly regulated. And a part of that patient is really tracing every product from its, you know, genesis all the way to its end user. So I think even we're, you know, you know, being ordered to a bowling alley or an office building or something that would, that would also be a challenge. You wouldn't necessarily know who the, who the end user is that it's being provided to. So I think it, I think it, this, we, we say delivery and I think it's implied if not strictly regulated that this is home delivery. So a, a follow-up question. Um, supposing a 10-year-old uh, or 15-year-old kid answers the door, do they have to get identification? Could a kid order his own stash? No, I, I believe uh, at the at the delivery point, uh, at that transaction point, a an ID has to be has to be shown and documented um, in order for that that's delivery to be fulfilled. But this is all of state law. Correct. This is this is all state law. Correct. A regulation. Yeah. So it is what it is. State law. Lou? And to Steve's point, the problem is that we are being asked to make a judgment on whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, so it's good to have all the information. One of the things I found out that I was told that was not exactly the case is that, indeed, the, can, the um, operator establishment can make multiple deliveries with a $10,000 value maximum in the vehicle as long as they are all individually ordered. That's quite a difference between someone delivering a couple of uh, parcels. Um, very valuable cargo. Uh, that's why everyone's concerned with some of the um, options here. It's the seller's risk. All right. Um... So I think we have, as usual, segued from, from questions for staff into comments, which is great. Um, are there additional comments or do people have um, suggestions on what, uh, what kind of recommendation we might send to city council? Mary. Um, so I was just thinking about the, the concern about um, uh, these companies maybe going into vacant storefronts and, um, you know, impacting the local retail economy as such. Um, I'm just wondering if, if there's a way to put in the ordinance that, um, similar to the, the retail establishments, that they have to be, you can only be within a certain distance of each other. Um, if a similar re uh, requirement could be put on these operators um, so that you would, you know, at least limit the impact on a particular resident um, retail area. 
I don't think I don't think they would want to be in a re space and pay retail rent. Yeah. Well, that's probably true. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, it's just it was raised as an issue, so maybe that's the best thing to do is just respond that we don't think it will have an impact then. Ted. Sorry, uh, I, I see no reason not to recommend this. Uh, if, if it can happen in other places, why not allow it here? I think I agree with Steve. This is so much over-regulation for the whole marijuana industry that doesn't happen to drugstores or liquor stores. And, you know, having used the past year Grubhub and other food delivery services, having deliveries would be nice. Um, I agree with the prior statement. We've got so many vacant stores anyway, that anything in a retail facility is better than having it being vacant. But I also agree that why would they pay retail rent when they could be in some other much less expensive area? Um, so, you know, I, I, I see no reason not to let the city do this. Okay. Lou? Yeah, I guess I have one last question and then a comment. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything that mandates um, the operation of this business in Cambridge that it would have a Cambridge address? So if it has a Cambridge address, then it's not going to be subject to Cambridge zoning ordinance. Just curious with our community agreement and so forth, if it needed to have a Cambridge address, because I don't really see anyone paying the real estate rates oh, in okay. Cambridge to park these vehicles. So that's why I'm just curious how much of this we're going to get, but it just doesn't seem, I, I wondered if there was something that tied this to a Cambridge address that was required. Daniel, just to clarify, I think you mentioned this in your presentation, uh, but uh, a a properly licensed delivery operation by the state could deliver to a Cambridge address from any other community. Isn't that correct? That's correct. Yes. Yeah, I know. I see no reason to uh, hold this up. I just wanted to clarify. It's nice to know what you're buying. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Um, any other comments or uh, issues for further consideration that we haven't already uh, brought up? Hugh. This seems to be a very complicated thing as my colleagues have said, overcomplicated. Our very talented staff has done an you know, a very job uh, of trying to make it work uh, in Cambridge. And I'm gonna sort of rely upon the uh, respect I have for their skills to, uh, to move that we uh, support this. Great. I, I, I tend to agree with you, Hugh, and, and I do think that the, the various comments and questions that board members have brought up for as areas for additional clarification or uh, consideration are, are helpful pointers, but I agree with you that I don't think they need to be resolved before this board for recommendation. Um, so with that in mind, Jeff uh, is, uh, or Daniel, I'm not sure which of you I should be directing the, this particular question to. Do you have what you need from this board if we are uh, uh, to put forward a positive recommendation? Thank you, Chair Connolly. Yes, I believe we have what we need to, to assemble a report that then can, can be put into a recommendation that goes to the council. Excellent. All right, then um, is there a motion to uh, recommend that the petition be adopted? Steve, so moved. All right, I had, oh, Lou? Lou second. 
Okay, I have Steve moved, Lou seconded. Uh, roll call vote. On that motion. Lou Bocci. Yes. Ted Cohen. Yes. Steve Cohen. Yes. Mary Flynn. Yes. Hugh Russell. Yes. Catherine Preston Connolly. Yes. That is all members voting in favor. Excellent. All right. That concludes the business on our agenda. Is there anything else from staff? I, there actually is one more thing that I believe it, it's on the agenda. Uh, it may have been omitted from the notes. Okay. Um, Swathi, can you, uh, can you do this one? The item on the agenda is the extension request for 698 Mass Ave. Yes. Got it. Thank you, Jeff. So I'm just pulling that up. Good evening um, to the board and chair. So this is uh, PB case number 373. This is the Citizens Bank in um, Central Square. Uh, we um, have a deadline to have the decision filed. I'm just pulling up the deadline. Um, uh, later, uh, early in June. So we need to seek an extension because uh, they are in the process of um, submitting their revised materials the continued hearing. They have been actively working with the urban design team to make the updates as recommended by the board from their first public hearing. How much of an extension are you seeking? So, as as to September 1st. September 1st. Yeah. So. Steve, uh, Steve, so move. There is second. 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 <laughs> All right, I'll do roll call vote. So this is a motion to grant an extension to September 1st, 2021. Correct. In this case. Uh, so Lou Bocci. Yes. Ted Cohen. Yes. Steve Cohen. Yes. Mary Flynn. Yes. Hugh Russell. Yes. And Catherine Preston Connolly. Yes. That is all members in favor. All right. Okay, unless I've forgotten anything else. I, I, I Catherine, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Jennifer, Daniel, what is the status of all the marijuana cannabis dispensaries, recreational dispensaries that have already been granted specials? <laughs> Um, good question. I don't think I can go through all of them. I can just say as a, as a quick summary, um, uh, the board has approved many of them. And then the, after the board approves it, there is a lengthy process of going through the state licensing. Um, there's also the, uh, negotiation of host community agreement with the city. Um, and the, the last I heard, there have been several host community agreements that have, that have gone through and I believe that those that there are, let's just say, a handful of applicants that are that are somewhere in the state licensure process at this point. So it's it's a it's sort of slow going, um, I think, for these applicants. But they many of them are making progress through all the various steps that they need to go through to get a license. OK, thank you. All right. Then uh, with that, uh, last call staff, I'm not forgetting anything else? Nope, okay. Then we are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Good night, everyone. See you next week. <laughs>